Hello, everybody. I can't wait to get into the second episode. So real quick, if you like what we do here and you want to continue trekking through the stars with us across all of the different series that we're trying to catch up on and understand and finally say that we are true fans of, that we know as much as this feeble brain will allow me to absorb, and you can tell everybody else that you've seen all of Star Trek as well, Hit a like and subscribe here on Warp Reactor, and we will get into each and every minuscule moment of Star Trek. Observe it, identify it, analyze it, and find out what makes it incredible. I think that's already obvious. The characters, the setting, the writing, everything about this is something that has encompassed pulp culture. And as for me, I always thought I was a fan until I realized just how much I hadn't seen. So now... Now we fix all that. Now we go back so we can go forward. Now it's time for season one, episode two, The Man Trap. It's the first one with Kirk. Let's do it. Captain's log. Star cool opening shot. 13.1. Our position, orbiting planet M100, Mr. Spock, temporarily in command. Spock in the chair. Our mission, routine medical examination of archaeologist Robert Crater and his wife, Nancy. Robert Nancy. Routine, but for the fact that Nancy Crater is that one woman in Dr. McCoy's past. McCoy backstory. When a man visits an old girlfriend, she usually expects something like that. That's straw, Jim. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be anybody around, does it? Well, they'll be along. You rushed us down ten minutes early. Kirk. Leonard. That's right. Hello. Leonard. Love it. It's good to see you. Let me look at that silence speaks volumes, Bones. I'm Kirk of the Enterprise. Mrs. Crater, I've heard a great deal about you. Oh, good, I hope. Is he here as old? They all see a different woman. Okay, and that's Darnell. And let Plum examine me all alone? Plum. So do Bones and Kirk see the same woman but different ages? And this is obviously a completely different woman for Darnell. Darnell's super dead, right? <laughs> Don't go, bud. Don't go. He's dead. Dead. See, that's the Venn diagram of horror and Star Trek. Shatner. The man trap. God, that ship's awesome. Professor Crater. Bob. We need additional salt against the heat. Aside from that, you're going very well, thank you. Go away. We don't want you. Hmm. All research personnel on alien planets are required to have their health certified by starship surgeons at one year intervals. Like it or not, Professor, as commander of the starship, I'm required to show your gold braid to everyone. You love it, don't you? It's all yours, Plum. Dr. McCoy. <laughs> Kirk's the best. You've seen Nancy? She went out to get you. You've seen her, too. You were with the good doctor. Yes, once. Looks exactly as I knew her 12 years ago. Amazing, Jim. Like a girl of 25. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Captain. Sit down. I seem to have forgotten my manners. Change of a, uh, a bit of his manners here, yeah. Excuse me, Professor. She's a handsome woman, yes, but hardly 25. I'm sure when Nancy let when you see her again, she'll be of a believable age. Let's. Darnell's dead, everybody. I'm going out on a limb here and saying Darnell's dead. What in the hell? McCoy. Dead Jim. Dead Jim. We got a dead Jim. 
killed him. I noticed he had a Borgia pack in his hand. Before I could say anything, he, he'd taken a bite from it. He fell. Look, you look at me like you don't believe me. No, 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 no. It's not that at all. It's something entirely different. Did he, did he just see her older? Did ask him about more salt, Captain. I'll take care of the provisioning, Nancy. Salt. Oh, that ship. Mr. Spock, sometimes I think if I hear that word frequency once more, I'll cry. Hmm. Tell me how your planet Vulcan looks on a lazy evening in the moon sphere. Vulcan has no moon as a rule. I'm not surprised, Mr. Spock. Landing party returning. They report one death. It could be Captain Kirk. He's the closest thing you have to a friend. Lieutenant, my demonstration of concern will not change what has happened. The transporter room is very well manned, and they will call me if they need my assistance. Well, then this man was not poison. He says she saw him eat the plant. Well, she's mistaken. I know alkaloid poison. What to look for? There's not a trace of it in his body. This man shouldn't be dead. I can't find anything wrong with him. According to all the tests, he should get up and just walk away from here. Really? I swear, Jim, when I first saw her, she looked just as I'd known her ten years ago. He did see her older. May have been looking at her through a romantic haze. How your lost love affects your vision, Doctor, doesn't interest me. I've lost a man. I mean, damn, Bones. <laughs> Guy sheeted up right beside you. Stardate 1513.4. Gotta love that. And Professor Crater and wife? Checked out perfectly. They arrived here nearly five years ago. Kirk here. Found something. What is it? I'd rather not put it on the speaker. Oh, what's the plaque say? Is it the like, commission plaque? Sodium chloride. Not a trace of it. This man has no salt in his body Can at all. Can you explain that, Doctor? I can't. You uh, in the mood for an apology? Uh, forget it. I probably was mooning over. I should have been thinking about my job. Perhaps you were. Was that an apology? One might think that you had more important duties than harassing people, Captain. Lost a man, Bob. A word. Mrs. Crater, I won't ask again. Possibly the other digging. We don't keep military laws. Marine finder. Yes, sir. He's probably dead. Considering the inescapable fact that you are a trespasser on my planet. Your complaint is noted, sir. Your planet? Bones, tell the professor what the autopsy revealed. Our crewman died of salt depletion. A sudden total loss of him. Medically impossible by any standards. And by coincidence, both you and Mrs. Crater requested salt tablets. Nancy and I started with 25 pounds. This is what we have left. Now, what is so mysterious about that? Wish I'd paid more attention in science. What else can you use salt for? Yet you can't do that. But I can, Professor. You mustn't do it. It'll interfere with our work. How? You've been here five years. Will a couple of days make a difference? Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Jim, he's run off. Damn! Nancy! Oh, she got them both. You! Salt! Smell it, Nancy! Now, is Crater trying to be a, 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 an unsavory gentleman to just kind of get him away from the planet and away trying to save him? Jesus. Two more. Jim. He's dead. That's another he's dead, Jim. I better locate Crewman Green. Green! Well, Green is gone, too. Darnell, Sturgeon, and Green. Uh-oh. Damn, this is a good episode. Nancy, it's Leonard! Beaming aboard the ship, Doctor. You can't be We murdered. can't search this whole planet on foot. Jim! Now you could learn something from Mr. Spock, Doctor. Stop thinking with your glands. We've equipment aboard the Enterprise that could pinpoint a match that anywhere on this planet. Or the heat of a body. Thinking with your glands. Love it. Okay, so can this creature maintain, I'm assuming, the same shape away from the planet. We had something similar happen in the, the pilot where the Telosians could only kind of do stuff on the planet. That was clever. When they beamed up, they had Green looking directly at Kirk. I want coordinates on two people. Acknowledged. There's a body down there, Sturgeon. We'll bring him home, sir. Now, can they scan and find the original Green body? 
Let's give it up to this actor, too. Some real good face acting. Something odd, Captain. You said two people. Professor and Nancy Crater. You did a reading on only one person. Multiple Crater. This is circling as if searching for something. Where are you, Sulu? You're the great bird of the galaxy. Bless your planet. Sulu! He's so animate, he makes me nervous. You can see the hand. I love it. Expecting one of these plants of yours to uh, grab me. I had no idea. So lose a botanist? Is that what it is? I had absolutely no idea about that. Botanist question mark? Hello, Green. He's not talking today. My man's all about that salt. Hmm. <laughs> Sense a predator. The door to my quarter still rattles when it opens. Would you stop by and see if you can do something about it? Truman, do I know you? In a way, ma'am. This is what happened to Darnell. Lieutenant Uhura to the bridge. I better get this tray back. Nothing to report, Doctor. We haven't located Mrs. Crater. What's the matter? Can't you sleep? By taking one of those red pills you gave me last week. No sleep. There's only one person within a hundred mile circle. All right, we'll triangulate on him. We'll let Professor Crater explain what happened to his wife. What's he eating? Really? Nancy. Wow. If you care, don't you, Leonard? Makes us feel so. So safe. So salty. <laughs> She's been telling me to take these. I think you should. I'll get you some water. Come on, Bones. Damn. Darnell, Sturgeon, Green, and... Oh, there she goes. She's going to dress up like him, isn't she? Dr. McCoy to the bridge. Great shot. You can see the cut, but that's okay. That's a great shot. Does the creature have access to Bones' memories beyond, like, the romantic? The answer lies with Professor Crater. Hey, there he is. Where's your wife, Professor? We're concerned about her. I'm on. Go away. Oh. Professor, you're a reasonable man. Let me... Hold on one second. Kirk here. He beamed up to the ship with us. Or something did. Damn. So how much can this thing absorb? Like, is the entire crew in danger? I mean, obviously over a period of time, but... You have an intruder aboard. Could be masquerading as Crimin Green. General Quarters. Security, condition three. General Quarters, though, isn't command crew, is it? Intruder alert. G Always one of the old uniforms? Negative, Lieutenant. But keep locked in on us. Kirk out. Let's get him. I like the phaser belts. Holy shit! We don't want you here! We're happy to Uh, no kidding! Obviously, taking him alive is going to be difficult. Set your phaser on one quarter. I'll leave mine on stun. Oh, I'm already in love with Kirk and Spock. Uh, I mean, I, I've known about them, obviously, from the movies and things, but Nimoy and Shatner together, so good. All right, Uhura, engineering deck now. Run through five photos of the crewmen there. Check. Deck five so Sulu, quarters. is that Crewman the science station? Not in his quarters. No one has seen him. Janice is a yeoman, but what's her last name? Or is that her first name or her last name? Still amazed by the sets. Still amazed they got away with this. Bill Shatner committing. Set. Acknowledged. Nice. Crater? Let him up. <laughs> Be 
Bingo! I like the little sped up film. Your wife, Professor, where is she? She's dead. So lost to work hard. What happened to your real wife? We were at Buffalo. What about her? Once there were millions of them. Prairies black with them. One herd covered three whole states. And then they moved like thunder. And now they're gone. Is that what you mean? Nancy understood. Always in the past tense. Where's your wife? Where is she now? Dead. We'll make a note right here. This is shows a lot about Kirk and the crew here. If they keep this creature alive or... It was not a crewman I saw. Young Rand, how long was this green with you? Rand. The creature is not dangerous when fed. No, it's simply trying to survive by using its natural ability to take other forms. Professor... I'll forgo charges up to this point. But this creature's aboard my ship. At it's four deaths, Jim. When it killed Nancy, I almost destroyed it, but... It isn't just a beast. It is intelligent. And the last of its kind. Are you gonna help us find it? Sorry, I can't. Oh, dude. I'll accompany you, Doctor. Oh, yes, of course. Spock figured it out. My money's on Spock. It was the creature. It hit me. The creator grabbed my phaser. I wondered about McCoy. Doubt it crossed my mind. Professor Crane. No way! Now, nope, there were your last chance of making it. Here we go. Are you insane? It killed four crewmen. Now crater. Go on with Nancy. Listen, t transport down a ton of salt, salt and... Bones. We know Kirk's okay, but... Oh, it's, the, it's almost the same as the mind meld. I won't shoot Nancy. Is that Nancy, Doctor? No. Way to go. It's gotta be you, Bones. Sweet Jesus! Oh, the suckers on the fingers are the things! Dude, shoot! She took it. She took the shot. Lord, forgive me. Yeah, I can't hold the form of death. Wow. What was she? Ready to leave orbit, Captain. Sulu at the helm. Something wrong, Captain. Yeah, it's almost killed, Spock. I was thinking about the buffalo, Mr. Spock. Warp one, Mr. Sulu. Warp one, sir. Warp one. Oh, look at that shot. Oh, fantastic. Hey, someone let me know in the comments, is this all remastered or is this the original, like, VFX? Oh, fantastic. Oh, I loved it. Great stuff, great stuff. All right, let's talk about it. All right, everybody, just got finished watching season one, episode two, The Man Trap of the original series. Um, I couldn't have liked it anymore, and I'm going to be saying that quite a bit, I'm pretty sure, because uh, this in and of itself was able to provide us with that wonderful mixture of tension, terror, and science fiction. Um, it's a formula that's worked very, very well in the past. I think the, the best example, I guess, in my opinion... Um, whenever you bring in, you know, movie or, or cinema length uh, uh, features like Alien or The Thing, you know, you have that same sci-fi terror and tension that wraps itself up, puts you in a familiar enough setting that um, you're able to understand what's going on, but it's not familiar enough where you can feel comfortable. 
And so even the environment has that tension to it because you're not exactly sure what kind of laws can it carry over is the same thing. You know, you're in space. What does that mean? You know, there's just a lot of unknowns to our our, our typical existence that, uh, again, create and I think add to that tension. Um, it, but it's great. It, it, it was a, a wonderful way, I think, to kind of bring Kirk in. Um, you got... you. you between Pike and Kirk, and we again, I, I say this, Jeffrey Hunter didn't have a real, I mean, he didn't have a lot of uh, time to work with Pike. He didn't have a lot of time to develop Pike or, or figure out Pike's nuances or anything like that. And in all likelihood, I mean, William Shatner, this is his first go around with Kirk, you know, or one of the first, depending upon how exactly they filmed these first three episodes. But, um, you know, he, he certainly hasn't become the Kirk that we will see decades from now when he's had a chance to, you know, really kind of get into it and really kind of, you know, become the role. I mean, William Shatner will always be synonymous with James T. Kirk. But I think that, you know, if it was the first time without me having this kind of, you know, uh, timeline inappropriate look at Kirk, you know, where I, my first experience with him was Wrath of Khan. He's gone through quite a bit before Wrath of Khan, you know, and now going back to see that, I think it was really well done. I think you get to see a, a really good place to kind of jump off with Kirk. It wasn't like an origin story or anything like that. It was this is a situation where we have four crewmen and the doctor or a point of interest, you know, the, the mission subject dead. Um, and that doesn't even consider the, you know, the buffalo, the, the last of the species. Um and it, it really brings up a lot. You get to see a lot with Spock. You get to see a lot of the interaction between Spock and Kirk. Um, you know, I think McCoy is a little off on this episode simply because he doesn't have, he's hung up on Nancy and the, the ideas of the past. And I think DeForest Kelly plays that great. You know, that even when he's not the creature, he's still distracted. He's still, um, you know, uncertain of himself. And I think that, you know, again, my experience being from the, original series movies, um, McCoy's always so certain of himself, you know? Um, he's very emotional, obviously, as the foil to uh, Spock's logic, but um, he always was uh, uh, steadfast. But, he, I mean, he could adapt to a situation and make the appropriate decision or, or evolve his own decision or advice, you know, depending upon the information that was given. But he always seemed certain of what was going on and of what he was advising or what he was telling or what he was ordering. Um, and this one, you know, obviously he's, he's a little distracted. And so we don't get to see kind of peak bones in this one, but I think this is more about Kirk and the relationship of the entire crew with these little brief windows of Kirk and Uhura. Um, and then we get to see, you know, uh, Yeoman Rand and Sulu who, Again, I had no clue. Was Sulu just down in that botany lab? It didn't seem like it since he had an understanding of all of the, the specimens and subjects that were in there. You know, and they had that he, she uh, comment about the hand uh, plant. But um, I had no clue that Sulu had a specialty in botany or, or whatever their like plant-based science they're going to say that it was. Um, I thought that was fascinating, and I'm really curious to see if that's explored at any point in the future. You know, are we going to see, you know, if they have another type of, you know, vegetation problem or plant problem or, you know, a poison or, you know, some type of environmental thing? Um, will that speciality even be brought back up or will we see him back down in that botany lab or, you know, um, it, it, I just think that is very it was fascinating to realize that there's so much about these characters that I have no clue about. And this was introduced in his origin. His first appearance was this kind of canonical bit of information. I had no clue. So if you're um, wondering about my aptitude, I am learning. Um, you know, I, I like I said, again, I always love Star Trek. Uh, but I realized too late, I guess, uh, in the, the whole spin when I grew up, it wasn't on TV. It was reruns, and it was a you know the original series was in a rerun competing with Mask and He Man. And um, I'm not ashamed to say I went with Mask because uh, my friends, Mask is uh, one of the, the the greatest cartoons ever. 
But anywho, I, I, a tangent off on the side. With this, I finally feel like I'm learning about the original series characters especially, but about the world of Star Trek from its origins. And, and, and moving forward, it's, um, it's, it's just so much information. Um, I am a little curious to see how it was received by critics because – or not, not even critics, but like the audience. I, I remember there being, you know, I've read plenty about how there was like the fight and the, like a letter writing campaign between seasons, I think two and three to keep the show on. And I wanted to know if like, if, if it started off strong, because this is a lot of information. It is dense. I mean, look how many people we were introduced to. I mean, just here, here's a crew that we're giving you right now. Um, it's a lot of names to keep up. And again, if you're not a fan of, of science fiction, um, it's a lot to kind of accept. You know, you're in space, you're at a planet that has a number, not a name. It's the last surviving creature. You know, um, it was a good to liken it to the buffalo to give some type of point of reference. But you're asking a lot of the audience, and I love that. But I want to know if it was received well enough for that type of deluge that was kind of given and dumped over everybody in the man trap. Um, I loved it though. I think it's a great episode. Um, I, I, again, I, I want to make sure that I'm not looking at these episodes with, you know, fanboy rose colored lenses that, uh, everything I'm going to love. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very critical going forward. And the things that I don't like, I, I will definitely point out um, if there's an episode that I thought was weak or it had something I disagreed with, I'm going to bring that up. Um, this one in of itself, uh, you know, again, many things have to be taken into consideration that you're looking at something from a specific time period. So I'm not going to delve into any of that. But um, I think that, you know, just from a story standpoint, just from a really this one is the once upon a time with, uh, you know, the cage kind of being a, a prelude. This is the beginning. This is the opening. This is the the advent of the Star Trek that we know, or that you all know, and that I'm learning. Um, I can't wait to learn more, though. I really can't. So, my friends, if you've liked what we've watched, hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that bell for notifications whenever we continue our trek. And uh, join us over on Patreon, where we do full-length watches and reactions to a bunch of things. But right now, let us finish this off with a couple notes that we have found. Greetings, mon capitans, and welcome to this installment of You and A. This is the little segment where I like to go back after having reacted and watched the episode, answer all the questions that I had that I didn't want to ruin or have meta knowledge of prior to watching the episode and reacting. So with that, I have a couple fun facts and a couple reactions from the past from both principal players, critics, and the audience. And also, like I said, a few little fun tidbits about the episode itself and what kind of part it plays in the pantheon of the behind-the-scenes Star Trek universe. So, let's start. And I think the easiest place to start would be James T. Kirk, William Shatner. I'm sure William Shatner has an opinion about the man trap. Is it positive or is it negative? Spoiler alert, it's real negative. Anywho, Mr. Shatner, in his memoir, um, stated that the man trap was, and I quote, a dreadful show, one of our worst ever. I love that he said one of our worst ever, as if one of our worst wouldn't just kind of sum up the fact that of everything he's done in Star Trek, it was one of the one of the worst ever, which that's a little bit of a descriptor that really means to my mind, Mr. Shatner. Not a fan of that one. Okay, absolutely, James T. Kirk's opinion and William Shatner's opinion carries a lot of weight. Um, I would think that almost of equal weight, if not equal weight, weight, despite their difference in rank, captain and first officer, is none other than Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock. How did Mr. Spock, the original, feel about the man trap? Well... He was negative too, but it was more diplomatic than Mr. Shatner, which I think after all of the research I've done that doesn't get into the specifics of the TV show, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I believe Mr. Nimoy was probably more diplomatic, period, you know, after the show and with interviews and stuff in the future after uh, the 60s. But anywho, what did Mr. Nimoy have to say about the man trap? Again, 
a little more political when he said that he regretted that a classic monster movie plot was used instead of something that was more indicative and more reflective of Star Trek as a whole. Again, that's a very political way of saying, ah, we could have had better go up. Mr. Shatner, it was our worst ever. This might be a running theme when we do some more of these Q&As. All right, so before we hear about what the critics had to say about it and what the audience had to say about it, let's get a couple fun facts just to kind of flesh out our experience of the man trap. The first thing that we were uh, told about this is this is the first episode of Star Trek. The first episode shown in North America, it was actually the sixth episode produced, which I find fascinating because if we watched our earlier reactions in our first Q&A about the cage, it's amazing this show was even made. Had a failed pilot, there's an incredible story behind it that once we get through the entire series, I mean to go back and have a, a, a full video on just how it stayed on the air, got on the air, stayed on the air, all that good stuff. Um, so, but after all of this failed plot, not only did pilot, failed pilot, not only did they order another pilot, they ordered a six episode treatment from a forgotten and failed pilot. It's just amazing. It, it, it flies in the face of everything Hollywood then and now, but by God, it was made. So this original one, though the first to air, was actually the sixth episode produced. And when NBC and the creatives, Gene Roddenberry and the like, sat down to decide what would be the first one aired, since they were episodic and not serialized, they could pick and choose, they, NBC, opted for The Man Trap. Because, <laughs> referring back to Mr. Nimoy, um, this classic monster movie plot was actually something that the audience could relate to, having seen something similar, and be able to have that touchstone going into a science fiction-driven area. Understood. Um, Mr. Nimoy and Mr. Shatner disagreed, but The Man Trap was our very first. The next thing that I learned that I found very interesting and I had questions about going forward was um, The Botany Lab where we first meet Sulu as he's sitting there eating his lunch, was actually the sick bay redressed to look like this lush arboretum type of area. Um, I stopped everything there. I didn't want to, you know, delve any deeper into that particular topic because I, during the reaction, was amazed that Sulu appeared there first. And I'm still unsure as to whether or not he was supposed to be like a specialist, like a botany specialist or a plant specialist of some some science, plant driven science um, specialist with maybe Helm not really being a part of his character originally, I don't know. Or that the the botany aspect would become like a, a secondary speciality that'll pop up in the future. I was scared that it was the second part and I didn't want to ruin anything for myself by looking up something and having like a future plot referenced and ruined. So I just stopped when I found out that the botany lab was actually a redressed sick bay. Will we see it again? I don't know. But um, an interesting take and an interesting extra kind of going the extra yard to uh the extra mile yard i mean that does not that's not very far going the extra mile to make something up and it seems very important that they did that otherwise they could have dropped sulu anywhere right i don't know but i will find out um the next part of it uh dealt with the moral dilemma of the episode and this is something that was a part of a rewrite kind of like an 11th hour rewrite by gene roddenberry the original script uh called for the moral dilemma and the killing of the buffalo, that the last of its kind creature, um, to be more pronounced, with DeForest Kelly actually acting, and when he assumed the role of the creature, acting and begging for his life. Um, I mean, that's very deep. And I think that personally, I would have loved to have seen DeForest Kelly act that out as the creature. But whenever they looked at it, they realized that it was just a little too dark and a little too asking maybe a little bit too much of the audience at this early going at this point they weren't sure whether that this was going to be the first episode but they knew it'd be obviously one of the six that they had produced so they wanted to kind of ease everybody into these themes instead of really kind of hitting something heavy out of the gate so Gene Roddenberry's rewrite for the final draft toned down the emotional aspect and that emotional final scene in favor of a more straightforward plot as a cornered animal the salt vampire, the salt creature, panics and actually kills its longtime partner in Dr. Crater or Professor Crater. Um, 
Again, I think that's easier for everybody to come to grips to instead of maybe feeling sympathy for the salt creature. And um, I think that's what Gene Roddenberry originally wanted. And to be honest, that would have been a more powerful tale. You know, showing the intelligence, showing the, the just, I just want to survive. I'm the last. That would have been an interesting, interesting way. And I wonder if they had gone that route, would Mr. Shatner and Mr. Nimoy have felt a little differently about the man trap? Who's to say? And the final little tidbit that I have uh, deals with the actual title of the episode, The Man Trap, apparently was the last one that they had settled on. They had a couple different ones that I thought were actually a little bit better, but they required The Man Trap to fall deeper in the lineup than number one. And I'll tell you why. The title that I loved was The Unreal McCoy. That's great. Unfortunately, that's only great if it's episode five or six when the audience has, you know, come to know Dr. McCoy and can understand the title. Jumping off with the Unreal McCoy, while it would probably, in retrospect, be a very interesting title, it wouldn't grab anybody who was just flipping through a TV guide. The Man Trap, uh, you could argue that maybe that wouldn't do it either, but it was more so than the Unreal McCoy. The other title I thought was a a, a little more more intellectual, I guess. That's, I hate using that word, but it was definitely the writers were thinking a little bit more and, and had a deeper meaning to the title than just The Man Trap or even The Unreal McCoy. And that title was Damsel with a Dulcimer, which comes from Sam, Samuel Taylor Coolridge's poem, Kubla Khan. Um, and again, with the themes and everything that pop up with that, you know, last of his kind and blah, blah, blah. That really shows the level of investment, I think, that the creatives had even this early on with the episodes and with the series. Really great stuff there. Now, finally, how did the critics view the man trap? It wasn't favorably. Um, so what I ended up doing was I went with a quote from Variety because Variety is a publication that's still around and it's still maybe not as important as it was back in the day. It's still very weighty and still a place where a lot of people go for showbiz business or showbiz news. So what did Variety have to say about the man trap? And to be fair, I think that or unfair, um, Variety actually looked at or was given several episodes in advance. So this statement that they make, I think, is Star Trek focused and not the man trap focused. It was just a blanket Star Trek dislike. And so they had a one sentence lead in for their Star Trek review, and it simply said, Star Trek won't work. Well, Variety, thanks for being super wrong. I mean, to be fair, in the near term of that article, it looked like they might be right, but several decades later, luckily they were wrong. As for the audience reaction, well, much like it is today, there was a group that absolutely loved science fiction and found it utterly fascinating that something of that intellectual bent and that type of creative kind of clay actually made it to television. Sure, there were people that didn't get it, just like there are people that don't get many of the projects and pilots that are launched nowadays. But that core group that loves Star Trek never stopped loving Star Trek. And today we have Star Trek because of those that loved. And I am taking this journey because of those same people. My friend, you are one of them. So thank you very much for watching. Smash that like button, hit that subscribe, or ring that bell for notifications for whenever we go live for any of our Star Trek related content. But until next time, Mon Capitans, be kind to one another. Cue out.